Good afternoon and, and welcome back. Hope you had a great day here. And uh, we, we thought to end uh, Family Day, at least the formal part of it, uh, by having a conversation about really the most important thing about uh, Marlboro, and that is uh, what, what impact does Marlboro have on the lives of our students? And we're really fortunate. We've got three uh, spectacular alums who uh, we're very appreciative. They took the time to come back to campus and, and uh, talk with us this afternoon. I'm going to ask each of them uh, to introduce themselves. And you'll see that they have a very uh, diverse background. Uh, but uh, uh, I suspect they have some things to say uh, quite similar about how the experience here at Marble College helped shape their lives. and the directions uh, that it's taken since leaving the college. The idea is to be a really casual conversation. Uh, we're talk for part of it, and I want to make sure that there's some time for uh, conversation uh, with you at the end. So maybe Catherine, uh, sure. you'd start, yeah? I'm Catherine Partington. Um, I graduated from Marlboro in 2009, so I've been out six years. Um, in the big bad world, and I am an actress, a dancer, a producer, and arts administrator. I've held jobs across all those fields. My current job is as the artist residency manager at Vermont Performance Lab, which is an artist residency program based in Guilford, Vermont, and we primarily support six to nine artists each year working in dance, theater and music, um, and support includes, for our artist residency program, we support people in like the early phases of their residency, so doing research residencies, development residencies, and production residencies. Um, all the artists get paid and supported for their work, and they get additional resources that we leverage through partnerships in the community. We have a lovely partnership with Marlboro College as well. Yeah, great. So, Thank you, Catherine. Welcome. Let's give her a big hand. Uh, hi, my name is Aaron Kosicki. Uh, I graduated in 2002. Um, I'm glad that I'm still being termed as a young Um After I graduated from Albro, I uh, went to a number of different places, New York, Boston, Minneapolis, wore a lot of different hats for a while, but I ultimately came back, settled in Vermont, I'm now an attorney. Uh, for the state of Vermont, I um, am a utility lawyer, and uh, I represent the public in uh, utility matters. So that's Great. what I do. Good. Welcome, Aaron. <laughs> Great to have you back. Uh, my name is Molly Booth. I graduated actually class of 2014, and um, so I've been out for about a year and a half. And um, as my main plan project, I wrote a historical fiction time travel young adult novel with, <laughs> with T, uh, T. Wilson and support from Paul Nelson, Geraldine, and um, Brian Mooney. And I actually, I sent that novel out to agents. I got an agent last fall and I just sold my book in a two book deal to Disney Hyperion in March. So. <laughs> So um, that's what I do for a living, and I live in Portland, Maine. Great, good. Uh, so we were going to start just saying, what is it, uh, Catherine, Aaron, and Molly, uh, what about your experience here at Marlboro helped prepare you for the big bad world out there, the incredibly interesting, challenging world out there? I think a lot of different things. Um, I came to Marlboro from an acting conservatory in England, so I transferred in specifically to learn what else I could do, to learn what I could be great at, to learn what I was terrible at but wanted to be great at. So I feel like Marlboro, the liberal arts focus, the possibility for interdisciplinary study allowed me to explore all aspects of myself, my interests, my passions. I think one thing that I remember as being extremely important for preparing me for the work that I do now is that every bit of work people will give, there are resources here that you can use um, through talking with your professors, uh, working with plant operations to get materials for whatever you might be working on, but you have to produce it yourself. And there is 
almost anything you can do and people will guide you, but you have to drive the ship of what you're doing. Um, and those skills of making it all happen, um, really, I use them every day. Um, so, I mean, I think this is maybe a different way to answer this question, but yeah. I mean, what we're looking at, what we're looking at here, is a group of people that are obviously trying to determine, you know, whether or not how they want to spend like hard-earned tuition dollars, and why a Marlboro education would be uniquely better than you know other options. And I mean, I can honestly say this, you know, being out of Marlboro um, for the number of years that I have, and, and being in a lot of different situations. I mean, I think ultimately. What Marlboro does, it develops three core skill sets. <clears throat> and, and those core skill sets are, are developed across all the disciplines that students engage in here at Marlboro. And those three things are, first, what you're able to do is, is you're encouraged to develop critical thinking skills so that you're able to evaluate critically a body of, uh, of works, basically, literature, what have you, um, you know, anything that's placed before you, you're able to engage with it, understand it, synthesize it with other things. Secondly, you're then able to sort of scope a response to that. Like, what do you want to say about this body of work that we've read, and how do you digest it? And how do you properly scope a response to that? How do you, and then how do you marshal the resources and evidence that you need in order to be able to speak about that thing? And then third is, you want to be able to convey um, what your response is to an issue in a clear, convincing manner in written word form. <clears throat> and that's what Marlboro does better than any other institution that I've ever heard of or seen of or anything like that. And those skill sets were developed really well uh, in, in my experience and I've seen them work for every other Marlboro student that's come here and has gone through it and all the way through to the end. Um, and I think What's even more important about that is, is even more so than when I was a student here, you know, the internet was just sort of its infancy when I was a student here. Now, given the ability that every student has to just access information at will very quickly, sort of the old model um, of a professor sitting at the head of a room and being sort of a fountain of knowledge, I mean, that doesn't really do anything for anybody anymore. I mean, you can get that information, however, you know, in any number of different ways. Now, what's even more important, I think Marlboro is even ahead of it, has been, has been doing this for a long, long time, and remains ahead of the curve, is, is it develops those skill sets that allows you to manipulate, un understand, manipulate, and articulate um, information in a way that no other school can do. So, I think that's the big thing that I took away from. Um. So uh, my Marlboro experience directly relates to my career <laughs> because I'm literally still doing my plan of concentration a year and a half later. Um, but plan was really why I came here. I wanted, I thought it was such a gift to have a school say, okay, here's two years, here's all the support and research and money for grants and trips that you need to do whatever project you really want to do. And I'd always wanted to write some sort of historical fiction thing, but I never thought I had the skills to do the research for it, and so working with Paul Nelson, who um, is actually on the board at Shakespeare, or he was a former board member on Shakespeare's Globe in London, like, he was a perfect resource for me. We went to London together, you know, all of these things were incredible. But what I really took away from it that I, you know, still use right now is um, the skills that I had to use during plan. I had to learn how to um, collaborate with someone on editing this creative piece together. And I still have to do that with my editor. I had to adhere to deadlines, which is incredibly <laughs> important now. Um, my editor tells me I'm like her only author that gets things in on time. She's apparently that's a rarity and she's I always think that I'm I'm later, I haven't done enough and she's like, oh thank goodness, like you got you got it in not two weeks late. Uh, good job. So um, so that's I, it's it's incredible to me that um, I've gotten to use all of those plan skills, you know, seamlessly right into what I'm doing now, which is really cool, um, and I'm really grateful for those skills. Um, Geraldine. <laughs> oh. I'm just gonna sit right. <laughs> just give us a different perspective here. So, um, <laughs> the other perspective of what, what is something that you wish you had learned something that maybe you came to Marlboro thinking you might learn? I mean, we've heard about multidiscipline, looking at 
issues from different perspectives, learning about critical thinking, scoping out material, digesting it, communicating about it, uh, about uh, a deep dive into an, an issue of, of great interest to you that has led to uh, a career. Uh, is there something you thought that you missed, would have liked to have here and you haven't had as part of the Marlboro experience? And this is unscripted. <laughs> um, I, I, that's really easy for me, actually. The two things I really wish I would have done here that I never did, and I, I honestly, it's one of the two biggest regrets I have in my life, is I didn't ever engage in learning another language, which I regret. Okay. Like, Great. And I'm trying very hard to learn French again. It's hard because now I'm an adult. But the other thing is, the other thing is, is that I, I never was able to study abroad. I never got to take a semester off, and I and I would think I would encourage everybody in this room who's going to go to college, no matter where you go, take a language, go abroad. Right. So unscripted, pretty good answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I think um, I probably, since I changed my plan like three times, I could probably change my plan a fourth time. <laughs> I probably would have done anthropology. Okay. Um, I wish I had been more engaged in broomball. Um, I did it one time, loved it. Uh, it was aggressive and great, but kind of slow motion because you're, like, <laughs> you're trying not to fall. So you're slowly, but there's anxiety. <laughs> it was really great. I wish I had done more of that. Um, That's why I was the goalie. Uh, <laughs> That's a hard position. Always the goalie. Yeah. The, the no, I don't think I could stand. I liked the like um, yeah. the stress of it. Um, <laughs> and. What I, I mean, I, I really wish actually I had served on some sort of committee. I, that was a huge selling point. I was like, yes, I go to this school, there's this town meeting, all these committees, and all my friends did it, and I was just like, did the academics. And I think that um, I could have made a little bit more space for serving the committee. Okay. Yeah. Um, I too wish I had done more of a language. I did take a semester of Latin, and I loved that, but that was my senior one semester, and I really didn't feel like I could do it for senior two. So I probably, I probably would have done, done a language. That would have been cool. Um, I would have read more. Now, I know that sounds really silly, because we read a lot, but I feel like I procrastinated, so sometimes my reading was more stressful than it you know, needed to be, and I do regret that. Um, but for the most part, I really loved everything. I, there are two things I think I would have done less of, which I know is another mm, part of this question. Yeah. Um, they're kind of silly, but I would have spent less time arguing on the Facebook group. That is not, <laughs> that is not relevant to your life after Marlboro, and it was a huge waste of time. Um, and then the other thing I wish I had uh, done less of was worry about dating, because that's such a thing people worry about here. But uh, when you graduate, you realize there are so many more people. <laughs> So if you're not Marlboro married, or you're not Marlboro married when you leave, your love life is not a black pit of never ending. <laughs> so you're fine. But, but the sea is suddenly vast. If you want right. <laughs> That's true. It can be overwhelming. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Prepare for that. How do I get somebody's phone number? <laughs> I'm not going to speak with every day. I just have to like walk up to him in a bar. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good point. What about if we open it up for questions? Uh, this is probably more for Aaron and Catherine because you've been out for longer and you talk about your plans. What are the two part questions? One is what was your plan? And the second is what were the steps you took when you first got out of school and how did you take what you did here as a thing on your resume and present it to the world and then move toward whatever law school I assume initially and, and whatever else and how um, my plan was I worked I did political theory with Meg Ma and dance with Kristen Horrigan um, I studied the politics of the creative process so that directly relates to everything that I'm doing now um, when I first graduated uh, I 
did a summer dance festival. I, I grew up as a performer in, in New York. So I had a lot, I had a huge background. So coming here was about learning how to write and doing other things. Um, but I went to this dance festival, which has been a, a big thing for, my, for me. And I randomly got a job as a dancer. Uh, I did not anticipate that at all because this is not a you know dance conservatory. The training was incredible, obviously, because I got a job. Um, and my first job was performing at the Guggenheim Museum in New York City. Um, so that was how it all began. And I think for the first three years, I just I was a performer. I did films. I did made for TV movies. I did. Um, I, I danced off Broadway, I did plays off Broadway, um, and I was just going kind of this uh, lifestyle of like getting a gig and you do it for a while and then you don't have something for two months and then you get the next gig. And so I really was like the classic like working artist supplementing with, you know, working over weekends as a waitress. And I did that for a while and I started to transition to producing, which I was really interested in. My connections here with Jay Craven, he started a pilot program, it was a pilot at the time, called Movies from, Mar from Marlboro, you might have heard about it. Um, so I was the co-producer for that first pilot program and we did Northern Borders. And that really, that really elevated um, my position from kind of doing this sort of lower, more assistant type work, but being this artist, I really wanted to get farther along in the administrative production aspects. And that really threw me like into something where I suddenly went from like this lower level to a co-producer level. I wasn't hired as that. I was hired as like assistant to the director. And I grew into that role um, and did a lot and took on a lot. And that was awesome. That, that set me up for the job I have today. Um, and the work that I have was all through connections here at Marlboro. So Jay Craven is my connection with him. My boss, Sarah Coffey, who's the founder director of Vermont Performance Lab, she graduated from Marlboro College. She was a trustee. I met her in a hallway. We became friends. <laughs> she was my mentor when I was an artist in New York City. She brought me down to New York and introduced me to everyone in the field of dance. She looked at my resume. I worked with my professors to look at my resume. And I think all of the roots that I lay here are, are you know, led to where I'm, I'm at. I very much so took advantage of everyone that I met as much as possible, <laughs> you know, like, um, and was, you know, where there's a spark, you go through that door. So this place opened a ton of doors for me and led to connections in other places, too. Uh, so I actually had a very different experience than that. Um, which, but uh, my, my plan was, uh, I also did a plan in political science with Meg Mott. Uh, my plan was, uh, a study, of, loosely a study of U.S. federalism broken up into three different parts. The first one being the development of the Commerce Clause in the United States Constitution. The second being the First and Fourth Amendment implications of the United States Patriot Act, which actually was passed during my senior year. And so like, I kind of got on it right when it passed and we did a study of it. Um, kind of the satisfying part about that was, as I remember, I had a fairly provocative argument about how the Patriot Act could be interpreted to justify domestic surveillance. <laughs> and, my, and, my, and, my, and my plans, and the, my outside examiner during my evaluation pointedly said, like, you are just, like, that is just no way. And he's a law professor now. Right? Just, like, That's right. Uh, <laughs> uh, and the last one was the, the legal pragmatism of all everyone law. So I know real page turning stuff. <laughs> uh, but what I did was, was um, is when I left Marlboro, I moved to New York City. Um, I knew one guy. I moved into an apartment. I had like 1,900 bucks, and I just didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to do anything. I mean, I didn't. I was just like, all right, I'm gonna get myself a job. And I just started writing letters, and I started, you know, I did it sort of the old-fashioned way. But I think the, the reason why it's notable was that, and, and this is, it's strange thinking about this now, but I remember I applied for a job and the office manager, of, I can't remember what it was, but an office manager called me in and she said, and I walked into the place and she sat me down and she said, I just want, she closed the door and she said, I just want you to know we're not gonna hire you. <laughs> and I said, well, why, why is that? And she said, we got a guy who's just, he's, he's really qualified, like, we kind of, it was like an inside hiring job, but she said, I was so impressed with your cover letter and your ability to write 
I'm going to help you find a job. And, and um, she actually didn't, but... <laughs> <laughs> but but I but I, I actually found I found my first job out of Marlboro in, in about three weeks and and it was literally just and I got a, I got a lot of positive feedback and that was the first time I really sort of felt like maybe the skills that I learned at Marlboro um, were a notch above what a lot of other recent graduates had so yeah. um, and I just just started working from there so but but I I really can't underscore how much positive feedback I, I've gotten over the years about just writing, just, just the nuts and bolts of mechanics and how, you know, it, it's just better. And I, lear and I learned those skills here, and, and they've, they've always served me well, so. Um, oh, and I will say the, the other, one more part to this your question is, is um, the transition from Broadway to law school was, I, I'm not gonna lie, it was a little bumpy, um, because it was, I was back in this, I was back in high school again, where there's there's a professor at the front. And you just this is what you read. And, you know, there's here's the nuggets you have to take out of this reading, and and, I, and it just I, I really didn't like law school because it just wasn't engaging. You know, and I I want to talk about this, the professor. I don't, there's nothing nothing to say about this. This is how it is. So yeah, you know, that was but uh, it's worked out well. <laughs> Yes, please. So it sounds like sure. the alumni network is really great, but what connection did you still have with the school or what support does the school actually offer um, in terms of career services or, or giving you extra help in that way? I think maybe if, if you can answer since you're the most recent graduate. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, so Lindsay is the new career services director. Or there's a new yeah. name for it, career and life planning or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, and she's lovely. She actually helped me work on my resume. And I, got a, I actually got a job um, the week after I graduated that I quit after two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, mm, no. Uh, <laughs> got to write. So, um, but she, she was lovely, and uh, honestly, the most, uh, and she, she's checked in with me, and I could, I know I could get in touch with her anytime I really need to, and she taught me how to use LinkedIn, which is actually really cool, because we have alumni networks in a lot of major cities, like in Boston, where I thought I was going to end up after, um, after I graduated. You know, there are people high up in publishing there, like, and she was totally willing to, like, help introduce me, so was Kathy Waters, she's a lovely alumni director, she is so supportive and great. Um, and then what I, what I kind of found was like a, an amazing amount of support giving I wasn't a current student anymore was how much my professor still cared what was going on with me. You know, they really want to know what you're doing and how you're feeling and how this transition is going and if it's going badly they want you to visit. You know, they're, it's <laughs> incredible. I talked to T. Uh, Wilson um, when he answers my emails, because <laughs> sometimes he doesn't check his email. <laughs> but when he, when he checks his email, um, I talked to him all the time. Last fall, I was thinking about applying to grad school. I was like, T, you're all my problems. <laughs> and he was like, OK. <laughs> so, um, so he was great. And Paul, my, um, my history theater professor, he emails me. So he's retired, and he goes to London every month now, leading these trips that he does. And he, he'll send me like everything he's seen that month in London. And he's like, this is what I thought of you and he's connected me to people in London, he's incredible. It is kind of though, whenever he sends me his schedule, I'm like, great, I'm so glad you're seeing every show I want to see. You know, I've, seen, <laughs> I've seen Benedict Cumberbatch and Hamlet, and oh, anyway. Uh, so, anyways, um, so it's, it's incredible how much support I've had from my professors. The, the rest is really great too, but it's, it's so cool. That part is really amazing. Yes, please. Um, this is kind of one question that kind of came up this morning where you had 70% of your students go to graduate school. Yeah. And which kind of led me, I guess it, there's two ways to kind of look at that. Um, one is that's great that you attract the kind of student who wants to keep learning, but also I guess the other kind of other side of that question is, is it because, you know, do, do the students need to go on to graduate school to, to get a job after this? Or is it just more of that's the kind of student attract? I, I would definitely, I would say it's the former, not the latter. Um, I, I spent s seven years between when I graduated from Marlboro and I went to law school, and I, I would have, you know, it wasn't, I didn't go to law school because I just, it wasn't, I wasn't fulfilled and I wasn't succeeding. It was just, that was just what I wanted. That was the next step. And um, I mean, we do have a high number of students, a good percentage that go into grad school, but um, there's a, a, a 
there's a significant number of students that, that I know now that I, you know, around the time I graduated from, they never went to graduate school, and they're, they're doing a lot of interesting, you know, great things. Um, you know, the other, I, I think another way to think about it is this, is that, you know, there's, you, you can you can evaluate or sort of like you know student success based on you know what the what their annual income is or something like that. But but I think what's more I think what's more significant with a lot of Marlboro grads is a lot of them are doing what they want to do. And if they don't and if there's not an opportunity for them to do what they want to do, they just make that opportunity. And that, and I think that's another set that's another skill set that is developed here, which is yeah. if you when you have to figure out how to get from point A to point B. And there's not a lot of, lot of handholding to get you from, from there. Once you go out in the world and you realize there's just all these resources that you, that are out there, and you just have to utilize them to get you to where you want to be. It's not intimidating to you when you've done it before. So, when um, I did apply to graduate school three years after Marlboro, and I I got in, um, I got into UCLA and Cal Arts. Um, those were the only two schools I applied to. And then I also got this job at Vermont Performance Lab and at the exact same time. And so I was faced with this, and I, when I was hired at Vermont Performance Lab, I was told, you can have this job for six months and then go to grad school, or you can stay. It's up to you. <laughs> she knew. And so I was like, oh, this is so, what do I do? And um, I had to really think about it because the job that I got is a job that someone with a graduate degree would normally get um, but then I got the job, and then it made me just sort of question, so what is graduate school about? What am I really going to, to do there? Am I going into the world of academia? Do, you want, do I want to be a teacher? Do I need to decide this now? Oh my God. Mm -hmm. um, and so I took the job because most people said this. Graduate school is always there, but jobs are not always there. They come and go. You know, or someone takes it and then you're, you don't get it. <laughs> um, so, I actually had kind of a, a similar experience. I did, an, I did apply to grad school and I got into an MFA program in New York and I at first was really excited about that, but then um, I got my book deal right around the same time I got my acceptance letter right. and um, I called one of my professors, Brian Mooney, who's actually an alum, he was a visiting professor while he was away. And he was like, what if you just wrote? Like, what if you just <laughs> give that a shot first and see how that goes? You know, you can go back and do yeah. that again. Or if, the, if you find out you want to teach, that's fine. And, um, and that was really good advice, especially since like a lot of MFA programs, like I, I very rarely write short stories. And that's what a lot of MFA programs do. So he's like, do this. You know, you, you know how to novel. Do the novel thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, that's, so that's what I've been doing. And that, that, I think that was a really smart decision. Because now that I'm thinking about grad school, I do think about it a lot differently too. Yeah. and critically, too. too. And I think if I go back, it would to get, be to get some sort of degree in um, literacy education or something like that. Because you know, most people get their MFA um, in the writing world to work towards that publishing contract. And I have that now. So. Think about what's, what else to do. Yeah. So if, if I may, I have two observations on, on that question, and I think it's a great question. And, and one is, is just hearing what they say and hearing from other alums. Uh, many of them uh, blaze their own trail, find their own way, <laughs> and, and they sharpen up what are the questions that they want to answer, what is the knowledge that they want to have, and ask the, the critical question, what's the best way to get it? And at the point in their life where graduate school is, then they opt. It's not necessarily the default. The other is they are lifelong learners. And it does come to a point in time where it's like, okay, yeah, I, I'm ready to do the kind of work I want to do related to environment or utilities. Or I need a law degree. But then it's very different. It's not your default. It's not the expectation that there's this lockstep process of go to undergraduate school and then go to graduate school. And, and the other observation is many of our alums are in what I think of as the serving or service-oriented professions. And often they do require additional training beyond the training we give here. I am very, very confident, and I hear this from many of our alums, that they're incredibly well prepared. In fact, as Aaron said, 
grad school, law school, whatever it might be, is often a disappointment because they don't have the collegial engagement around the education process that they have here. It's much more hierarchical, learn this, this is what you have to do to pass your exams, take the bar. So we spoil them here. <laughs> Definitely. Right? Yeah. Are there, are there questions? We've got a, about 10 more minutes if you want for questions. Yes, please. So why did each of you choose to over another? Good, great question. So why did you choose Marlboro? Because <laughs> we all have choice, right? Yeah. <laughs> I only applied to Marlboro. Um, I had gone to the Putney School, which is a boarding school nearby on a farm. Um, and then I left uh, and was in Eng England, and that was awesome. And I remembered Vermont, and I loved this place and this kind of rural environment. Um, I think for me, why I chose Marlboro from visits is that I was really interested in, like how I describe the school is that it's a talking school. In, <laughs> um, the classes, the discussions in the classes are highly rigorous. Not only like the writing as Aaron was talking about, super important, I really learned how to write here. Um, it was a frustrating process for me. I didn't come in with strong writing skills and I failed my first writing requirement. Um, my friend failed and then she was published in the New York Times. I mean, really, <laughs> so it's like people, you just, you learn and, and people push you. Um, and that's been really great, but really the talking aspect and the discussion aspect is what I was fascinated by. People were having, people were listening to each other and having group conversations in a way that um, I just hadn't seen and I wanted to know how to do that. Um, and yeah, for me that's what really attracted to me this school. Um, I was homeschooled in high school and then I did two years of community college before coming to Marlboro. And um, that was kind of to get my, because I was unschooled, I don't know if any of you are unschoolers or know that, but I was unschooled and so I didn't really know how to do homework in a traditional sense. <laughs> so I decided I would do community college for two years and, um, and while I was there I really got a taste of what that kind of education was going to be like, like more at a state school or something like that. And uh, by my second year I was like real sick of it. <laughs> um, I had so many lovely professors there but the learning style wasn't what I was interested in, that was very much like absorb material, regurgitate test answers kind of a thing. And so I looked exclusively at colleges that change lives colleges. And uh, I thought I really wanted to go to Hampshire. And then I found this college too. And I was like, oh, okay, that also seems kind of up my alley. I guess I'll, I guess I'll apply there too. And um, a couple things made my deciding factor. Number one, I'm gonna be real here. Marlboro gave me a lot more financial aid. <laughs> and that was great. And I really appreciate that. But, but that also showed that they really sure. believed in me as a, col as, you know, as a college. They like really, you'd fit here. And so that was a, that was a really cool vote of confidence. Um, and then, you know, a, a couple great things. I had just gotten into Shakespeare and I showed up and there was Shakespeare all over the walls here. And I was like, all right, <laughs> that's awesome. Um, and then like silly little dorky things like the campus felt homey and there was a guy wearing a Firefly t-shirt when we pulled in and like all, <laughs> all of this stuff that, um, that kind of just added up to this feels like the right fit for me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, um, I transferred here from uh, the University of Nebraska. I went to Nebraska for two years, and um, I'm from Nebraska, and so that's kind of where everybody went. And um, after two years, I just realized it just I wasn't engaged um, really with what I was doing. It was just sort of an extension of high school, and um, I actually had a high school professor or teacher, I guess they're called. Um, but he he had actually I mean he was the guy who started teaching me how to write when I was a student in high school. And he said, hey, there's this college in Vermont. You might want to think about it. I thought, that's 2,000 miles away. I'm not going to think about that. <laughs> <laughs> but after I left the rat, I, I quit college after two years and moved to Boston. And so I thought, oh, I'm pretty close. Um, but I did a lot of research. And I think it was the same thing. I was, I was looking sort of in the same vein of you know, colleges that changed lives. I went and looked at St. John's. I went and looked at uh, you know, St. John's. <laughs> and, and, uh, and it was just, and, and you know, and I think it's, I think it's a peer school, I would call it. But mm -hmm. you know, when I came here, the the level of discourse that was occurring and class discussions yeah. was a little deeper. Um, it was just a little more intimate. And uh, by the time I showed up on campus for a tour, 
uh, you know, I, would, I took a 20 minute tour, I had to go back to work, and I knew after 15 minutes, I said, okay, this is, I can tell. So, it was a good fit. Yes, please. So, uh, it's kind of two questions. So, what are the biggest challenges, Kevin, you feel are here, and you know, I guess two? And do you do the size, which we do as positive, our students are here, our guys are here, and to the cataract, and we do the size as a negative? What's your counter to that? We're starting with that. Okay. It's you know when I first got here, I'd been doing, I'd been working really hard at community college, but like you know, and I was ready to work harder. I was ready to throw myself into to, into my academics. Um, but it is kind of like a hit you in the face curriculum. <laughs> you know, you get here and you're taking more credits, and you're expected. Everyone is expected to have done the reading and have taken notes. Um, the expectation is pretty high. So that's that's challenging, but like also a wonderful thing. It is a wonderful thing to come to class and everyone's done the reading and everyone's ready to talk. So it's a challenge, but great. In terms of size, uh, I was talking to, because um, my sister goes here now, and I was talking to my professor, Geraldine, about it. And um, we were saying how it's funny when you first get here, the community feels so small, but it also feels like there are so many people around you all the time as well, because you know everybody. So I think there, it's definitely challenging um, to go to a school with two to three hundred people. That's you know you know everybody by how they walk in the night. That's like <laughs> it's true. Um, but in terms of like you know I think you know spending time off the hill and I think um, studying abroad is wonderful to get some perspective on the community you have here because as a transfer student coming in having had a you know, went to a community college that was mostly day students, like 15,000 people coming in and out, not a lot of, you know, seeing the same people all the time. For me, it was really wonderful. It was wonderful to have all of the same people around me all the time. I had really great friends, and I didn't really mind that so much. Um, and <laughs> taking into consideration, my homeschooling graduate class was one, though, so <laughs> it was felt bigger. The, the challenge of it being a small place, how I, I mean, I think about it as like small town living, and I like that this school is not in a suburb and it's not in a city, but I grew up in a city. Um, I, I like that it's in a rural place, and I think there's something about small town living where there's a responsibility that you learn for the people that you live with, and a sense of professionalism. Um, and it's, you really get highly, highly trained social skills when you live in a small space with the same people and you know everything, right? Um, or maybe not everything, but you think you know everything. Um, and so <laughs> I liked that, but how I resolved that is I didn't like just being up here. I didn't, I, I needed to have a car. And um, I really, there's a lot within like 60 miles of this area. I really went out into the community. There are some really cool organizations. Um, there's an amazing uh, marketing company. There's, uh, you know, in downtown Brattleboro. So for me, I didn't just think of this as being my only world. I thought of this as being part of Southern Vermont. I thought of this as being close to Northampton. Um, there are performances all over. And so I really looked at this as more than just on a, on a hill. And I lived off campus. My first year I lived on campus, but I think partly the reason for that is that I had grown up primarily living like at boarding schools, so in dorm rooms, and I had done that already. And I really just needed my own space. But, and, and I think that gets to one thing like that I would encourage students to do here, is that the academics are really important and the plan is really important, but it's also really important to learn about the people living and working around here. I got a lot of work out of just doing that. And um, to take advantage of this community and the greater community. Um, so. And then the, I would just say the biggest, I think the biggest challenge that the college has, um, I it, this is sort of putting it into perspective, is when I was here, I think the biggest challenge the college had was how do you make this experience relevant to the outside world? I mean, how do you how do you not make this just sort of a utopian place on a hill? I and mean, yeah. I said a utopian hill, where and then you leave and you're just sort of there's right. this world outside. And I think the, the college has, has devoted a significant amount of resources since my time here and has done a very good job of bringing in 
you know, making what we do here relevant to the outside world and bringing the outside world here to sort of show that interaction. Um, in terms of the, the size issue, I think it's a really valid concern for anybody that was thinking about coming up here, but I think the way to, res the only response I really have to that is, is you really just ask yourself the core question, like, well, what is it that you really want out of your education? I mean, if you want to be able to have, you know, a robust um, set of, you know, intramural sports, like, sure, the population here is not going to support something like that. I mean, there's just certain things that the size just doesn't allow us to do. But with that said is, is if what you really want is, is to have, is to have an experience at a community that is like-minded in terms of being able, wanting to engage in what they're doing kind of full, in a significant way, I think you're ultimately always going to end up with a, with a number, smaller numbers. I mean, you just, you're not going to be able to sustain that sort of focus with 5,000 people, or even 500 people. So really, I think that the number in a lot of ways is a function of what the core mission of the college is and how do we sustain that? How, do they, how does the school sustain that mission the best? And I think the numbers issue, it sort of plays into that. And, and it's, it's ultimately a strength. Um, but I think you're right, it's a, it's a valid concern about resources that are available given the class sure. size. So I'll take a slightly different uh, approach to that uh, and speak very candidly uh, for the college. Our challenges are really twofold. They're about recruitment and finances, not for the first time in our history. Uh, in fact, it, it, this, it, these are issues that are really perennial issues for the college. But certainly in this environment, with challenges about higher education in America, particularly about liberal arts, especially directed towards small liberal arts institutions. Um, I think our board is acting very uh, boldly. We're uh, announcing on Monday a new plan called the Renaissance Scholars Program uh, that will be one tuition-free scholarship for a student from all 50 states with the idea of recruiting people who are not only passionate about the academic experience we provide, but our community builders who will come and yeah. add to the community here and have some kind of service orientation, a notion of giving back. Uh, and I think that's going to be really exciting and provide a really unprecedented opportunity for the college to uh, recruit nationally, diversify our student body, and grow our numbers somewhat. Uh, we don't want to grow too much because when you think about your college experience, most of us, we don't really remember the content. What we remember are relationships and two kinds of relationships. Our relationships with our professors and with our classmates. And, and we think that this community environment we're in is really optimal for maximizing those relationships. And, and that's what I hear time and time again. And how many times did you hear our panelists talk about Meg Ma or talk about T? Uh, that's what they remember their professors and what they learn with their other students. If you get much bigger than that number, that's hard to have that those same high quality intensive mentorship experiences that I think are, are just fundamental to the Marlboro experience. And, uh, for me, I think that's one of the real reasons why Marlboro matters so much. So um, we're, we're said we'd wrap up by four. So could I ask you to give everybody a really big hand? Uh,